I can see the clouds rolling I can feel the winds they try to shake me but I will not be moved my feet are on the rock ooh, ooh, ooh. I can feel the waters rise I can hear the howling lies that haunt me fear won't hold me now my feet are on the rock When I feel my home about to rain, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters call and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. Ooh, ooh. I can see the morning light. I can feel the joy of the horizon Here my faith is found I stand on solid ground When I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters fall and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain Rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand So stomp your feet and clap your hands Our feet are on the rock On Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand So stomp your feet and clap your hands Our feet are on the rock On Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand So stomp your feet and clap your hands Our feet are on the rock And I feel my hope of rock to break I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain When I feel my hope about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain Well, good morning. That's a good way to start out a Sunday morning. My name is Cody Pritchett, and I'm the youth director here at Christ Church. And I want to welcome you to Christ Church. If you're a first-time visitor here, we want to especially welcome you. It takes a lot of courage to come to church and be in a new place. So God welcomes you, and so do we. Last week, Pastor Nathan was talking about having a long-term impact on the next generation. And he gave us a couple of opportunities. And I wanted to share that there are a couple opportunities for the youth ministry for you to be able to serve whoever you are, wherever you're at. And who are we looking for? We are looking for caring adults who love students and want to impact them with their money, with their presence, with their time, and with their gifts. We're not looking for cool people. We're looking for caring people. We're not looking for relevant people. We're looking for relational people who just love young people. There was a study done recently that, that talked about the number one factor that impacts teenagers. And do you know what the number one thing that teenagers are impacted by is relationships. And teenagers who stick with Jesus and start with Jesus have one thing in common. They have five meaningful Christian relationships. So I want to invite you guys, someone here, uh, someone who's listening, to come join our youth team and be one of those five meaningful relationships. If this moves your heart, a good next step for you would be to send me an email. Um, my email is pretty simple. It's youthdirector at christchurchchat.org. Or you can call the office and ask for me. It comes right to my cell phone. So. If you're interested in serving with the youth and using your gifts and passions for the youth, please contact me. I would love to have you.
I'm Becky Hall. I'm also on staff here at Christ Church as the executive director. This is a really important way for some of you that might be looking for a niche, a way to serve. Um, have another opportunity for you. Um, some of you have probably seen in your bulletin or maybe on Facebook that starting September 5th, we're going to be starting a new Thursday evening service. We are very excited about this. It's a huge endeavor. Um, it will be held down in the commons from 6.30 to 7.15. It'll be just kind of a relaxed uh, contemporary style service. Uh, the message will be different than the one on Sunday morning, but we know a lot of our folks travel on the weekends. Uh, uh, several people work or at least work some Sundays. So this is an opportunity for them to be able to attend their church and worship, invite neighbors, people that um, Sunday morning just doesn't work out for. But what we need from you is we're asking for 50 volunteers who will continue to worship on their Sunday service, but also commit to attending that uh, Thursday evening service from 6.30 to 7.15. We need a faithful core of people who will help us launch this service. Um, it, you will be blessed you will get to meet new folks. And so if you are interested in that, we have sign-up sheets out at the uh, information desk and or just call the church office. We'd like to have your name so we can kind of keep up with who's committing. And also now we have some other things that might be of interest for you uh, that in the life of the church. Now let's stand together and we're gonna lift up a song of praise. The song, we've been singing it for a couple of months now. So let's declare this, that we have a confidence in a faithful God. Let's sing this out. I have this confidence because I've seen the Faithfulness of God, the still inside the storm, the promise of the shore. I trust the power of your word, enough to seek your kingdom first, beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves.
this together. My hope is built on nothing less. Lift this up. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prayer. Gracious and holy God, we so thank you for the love that you provide for us, the care that you give us, this love that we know as your grace. We thank you for the sacraments of the church that show us your grace in special and holy ways. In particular, today we thank you for the gift, the grace that we receive in the sacrament of baptism. We pray that as Alex and Sarah become such a part of this church that you will bless them 
that we know that they will also bless this church. As the summer months are just flying by, we know that this is a time of family trips and vacations, and we give you thanks for that. We ask for safe travel for those who are away from us, including Pastor Nathan today and Vicki. Sometimes we look to the summer in the church and we think, ooh, we're going to get some rest then, and then summer comes and we are as busy as ever. But we give you thanks for good work that's been done this summer. We thank you for our youth and for our youth choirs, for trips that they've made, for missions that they have performed. We thank you for Vacation Bible School that happened here and at the Bethlehem Center. We thank you for the work of a mission team that we sent to Costa Rica where they served. And now as summer begins to shift, we ask your blessings on new things that will be happening here, on new small groups, new classes. We pray your blessings on a capital campaign that will happen next month and a beautiful new worship service that begins in September. Please, Almighty God, keep your vision before us as a church and help us to see that vision, but also give us the energy and the commitment to live out that vision. We know that among us today are families and individuals with special needs, and we would lift up the need for healing. We would lift up the need for comfort for those who have lost, lost loved ones. All of us come to you seeking your guidance in our daily lives, especially in our making of choices and decisions. We pray that you are with Pastor Ann as she comes to preach your word this morning. And now we pray together as our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you our preacher for the day, the Reverend Ann Robbins. Uh, Pastor Nathan has earned a vacation, and he and Vicki are in Florida today. But before he left, he arranged for this guest preacher for us, someone that he knows very well. Uh, Ann has degrees from a number of schools, including Vanderbilt. She, um, she got her seminary degree from another denomination. I won't say which, but it begins with a B. And, uh, but she finished it up. She rounded it out with that good old Methodist seminary over at Duke University. She has pastored a number of United Methodist churches in our conference, most recently Ebenezer United Methodist Church. Today, she is the district superintendent of the Tennessee Valley District, which is headquartered in Knoxville. Would you welcome Pastor Ann Robbins? Uh, good morning, church. I I'm glad to see that the church our pastor isn't the only one where folks sit in the back and in the uppermost parts of the world, right? Uh, it is a joy to be here with you this morning. We're talking today about difference makers. And if you have your scriptures in, in written form or electronic form on your phones, I invite you to open them with me to Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, and then place a bookmark there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as well. Will you pray with me just a moment? Jesus, we know you're right here in this space. But God, we know that you don't come where you're not invited. So right now, I invite you. And I ask for these folks to agree with me too. That we invite you into our thinking and that you will speak truths into our hearts and into our minds and into our lives. God, we ask you to speak to us today in your powerful words of wisdom for life. In your name, we give thanks. Amen. Well, as you look at all these faces, one of the things that I think about are the difference makers in our lives. And maybe you can remember the difference makers in your lives. I, I had this amazing mom and dad, and I, I grew up like this precious little baby girl in a church. 
that claimed me for Jesus before I could claim Jesus for myself. And that taught me. It was very intergenerational. I knew young, middle, and old uh, and received wisdom from each. I had amazing grandparents, grew up in a neighborhood and a community and a church with friends that were awesome uh, and that we did things together in the course of life and created great memories. But you know, there are always those difficult people in our lives, right? And we get a choice who we hang out with and who we spend time to and who we give access to our heart and and our mind and our life and our choices. I give thanks. Maybe many of you had some amazing teachers. I remember one in particular. It was a chemistry teacher. Not that I was good at chemistry, I was thankful to get out of there with an A minus. But but one of the things my chemistry teacher did is spoke truth into my life. I remember her words of wisdom. I remember her voice of encouragement that said, you have leadership gifts and you need to use them. She didn't happen to mention anything about chemistry, right? But, but you have leadership gifts and you need to use them. And that stuck in my mind. I met my wonderful husband. He was in law school when I was in undergrad. And he has been an amazing encourager in my life. He he can look past my challenges to say, you need to press on. You're getting stuck, right? I'm so thankful for his encouragement. But I want to tell you about one little fellow that was amazing in my life. It was my son. And he was in fourth grade. You know, difference makers come in all sorts of sizes and shapes in life. It was my first time I'd served on staff in another denomination and in the United Methodist Church. But it was my first staff under a first opportunity under appointment as the pastor. And we've always lived in like Dallas and Birmingham and Nashville. And and Knoxville was one of our smallest areas. And I was appointed to, to rule Blount County. And my children had lived in the same house all their life, the same, same ball teams, the same swim team, the same schools. And he wanted to support his mama, but he didn't want to move. Boy, change is hard for us. But sometimes we don't learn what we need to until we get outside those comfort zones and jump into change. We went out to meet people, maybe like y'all did with Nathan the very first time. And we went into the church parsonage. It wasn't quite like our house in West Knoxville. And, and you know, all the way through, I, I told myself, it'll be okay. Whatever it is, we'll fix it. It'll be okay. Then we went into the church building. Have you ever been in space where you think, this space feels dead? Oh, Jesus, give us life. And we were there, and we ate together. And after we ate, the, the district superintendent introduced me to the to the folks there and this precious little lady put up her hand and she said oh but I thought we were still just talking about this because I don't know if you've noticed I'm a woman and that wasn't really what they wanted you know Jesus shows up in a lot of different ways right and and we went on and and finished that meeting and we were in the church parking lot and my sweet little fourth grade son said mama I don't think they like you very much And before I could say, son, they're just afraid. They're afraid of change. They're afraid of what Jesus looks like when Jesus shows up differently than we expect. But before I could say any of that, my son said, this little boy who did not want to leave his home or his school or his swim team or his soccer team, he said, but mama, they'll love you in a year. And after they did, I told them that story. You know, friends, we need to be looking for ways that Jesus can show up instead of saying, no, you can't show up like that, right? There are difference makers in our lives, and sometimes we miss them. <clears throat> so when you look at this next picture of this, of this coat, I want to tell you the story. In, in the New Testament times, after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, Disciples began to to grow and to believe and to spread like wildfire. Oh, Jesus, please do that again, right? 
Please help us to be open to new ways that you're showing up in our lives, even little children, right? And so when, when that was happening, there was a man by the name of Stephen. He believed with every breath of his soul. And, and the, the, the church folk, the religious folk, the Sanhedrin said, well, no, you can't be that vibrant. No, you can't be that alive. No, you can't say that. No, you can't do that, right? <laughs> Somehow when a person, people try to take Jesus and go small Jesus down, it somehow stokes the fire in our soul up a little more, right? So Stephen really got at odds with the church folk. And the Sanhedrin sought to eliminate him. There was a man there that day by the name of Saul. Saul was a young man. He was born somewhere between 5 BCE and 5 AD, so he wasn't much younger than Jesus. He was born into a, a wealthy family, well-educated, a Roman citizen. He had fire in his soul, too. He was motivated and driven and had already reached the rank of Pharisee. In his, in his religious world. And he was there. You know, I kind of picture him like that kid at the water fountain who pushes the kid in front of him, and that kid gets in trouble, and they stand back and go, one me. So, so here is Saul. He's there. And my sense is he stirred up the folks to eliminate the voice of Stephen. And they begin to stone him. They begin to say, no, no, no. And they threw off their cloak so they could, that they could stone him. And there was Saul, and they threw him at his feet. You know, there are times, friends, that we have to use our voices. And when we're present, Saul affirmed all of this. But there are times when we don't use our voices that people assume that we're affirming. And we need to find our voice. And sometimes say yes and sometimes say no. But to say nothing implies we agree. And one of the things that Stephen said as he was bleeding, as he was being killed, was, God, forgive them. And do not hold this sin against them. Can you imagine this young Saul here and go... I have instigated, I have encouraged this man to be killed and his belief is so strong and so powerful. He's asking God not to hold this against me. Oh, I believe that planted seeds for what happens next. And, and you remember the amazing conversion of Saul. He, he went to the, to the religious leaders and, and he said to them, as you look at this black screen, right, just black. He went to this religious leaders and he said to them, he wanted permission to go to the city of Damascus and find all of the believers and, and grab them and pull them out and throw them in jail. You see, at this time, the Jewish leaders were were in their small area the same as the political leaders. In so many ways, they had that authority and power within the Roman structure. So he went with a letter. So much so, and they didn't even have news, right? They didn't have TV, and they didn't, they didn't get it on their phones and their watches. They knew about this guy, and they were afraid. They were afraid. So here is Saul, young Saul, and, and his followers, and they're on their way to Damascus with this paper that gives him authority to end lives or put people in jail for believing just like Stephen. And they have heard what happened to Stephen. And there was a great persecution of the church after what happened to Stephen. And the people, the believers, spread throughout the world. You see, one of the things God has been teaching me is not to be afraid of hard times. Two years ago, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And God taught me in the middle of that to claim the promise of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good not all things are good so God when I have hard times I say leverage this heartache Jesus leverage this pain for good so God leveraged the pain of persecution to spread the good news all around 
So here's Saul. He's coming with authority to try to give a stop to it in Damascus. And he's on his way, and it's noon, and he sees this amazing bright light. And Jesus, the one he says is dead and doesn't exist and isn't God's son, isn't God in flesh, isn't God incarnate, isn't God walking around among us, is dead and doesn't exist, right? And so Jesus speaks to him and he said, Saul, Saul, right? he calls us by name. Jesus calls us by name. Every one of us are the apple of God's eye. We're God's sons and we're God's daughters long before we understand who our creator is. God's at work, just like he is in this beautiful little baby girl's life. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Lord, Lord? I think he said it like a question. Lord, who are you? And he was very clear. I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you persecute. The one you say is dead. The one you say is not God. And he became blind. So can you imagine a driven human being? Oh, I picture him at this point in his about 30 years old, educated, driven, powerful, pressing on to his goal, right? And he's blind. And and the people with him are having to lead him by hand, friends, to the city of Damascus. Now, this is a person that isn't used to being led anywhere. He's used to leading. And he spent the next 72 hours in darkness, not eating and not drinking, because all he believed to be true, the God that walked among us spoke to him speaks to us if we will invite and listen he always tells us behold I stand at the door and knock but you must invite me in I will not knock the door down so there is young Paul driven motivated educated has his vision of what life's going to look like he's going to be the 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 head the chief priest the head I just picture him he's he's, I'm pressing on to that goal and here Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Do we get that? I think Saul spent 72 hours in darkness trying to get that. Jesus is alive. What am I going to do with that fact? What am I going to do in my life with that fact? The God that walked among us as flesh and blood like you and I that overcame even death. So whatever I'm dealing with is less than death. And Jesus is more powerful than death and gives me power, grants me grace, grants me love. So Saul spent three days in darkness trying to reconcile this. And he told him about this man that's going to come, this difference maker. That's going to come and show up in his life. So in Damascus, there's this man. And his name is Ananias. And the Lord called to him in in a vision, Ananias, awake, call him by name again. Isn't that cool? God knows his children by name. Whether we believe or not, God is calling us by name. It's not that God's not calling. It's that we're not listening. Ananias. Ananias is listening. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he, Saul, has seen this man, you, Ananias, coming And I want you to place your hands on him and restore his sight. You know, friends, he literally couldn't see. But the truth is we all have some levels of of blindness and darkness in our soul that we're not seeing. And God, we're asking you to help us see what we cannot see. Restore and healing us to the person you've made and created and gifted us to be. But I love Ananias' response. 
So he's about to say, well, in case you didn't know, Lord, this guy saw is bad news, and I need to be running the other way from him instead of going to him, right? Just in case you didn't know, God, let me just kind of explain this to you. It's the yes, but. Do any of you do that? God, call somebody else. I got a whole series of yes, buts, and I did right? But my difference maker, my husband, which is a, a lawyer, preacher, oh, and I tell you, that makes for a real challenging combination. He would say to me, honey, why don't you just stop arguing and say yes to God? Not yes, but, but just yes, God. So here's Ananias. Yes, but, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people. In Jerusalem and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all of us me us who call upon your name I'm at risk I'm afraid are there moments in life that you're afraid I, I, I have moments that I'm afraid I'm supposed to give nurture and encouragement to 84 churches but God I choose not to live in fear because you have gone before us and you are with us, and you will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard these many reports, right, about this man and all the harm he's done. <laughs> and, and listen as God says to him, hey, I'm all-knowing, I'm all-powerful, I'm here, right? Ananias, right, know who I am. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. Then Ananias went. Unlike many of us who are still in our yes but, yes but, yes but, yes but stage. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And he placed his hands on Saul. And you know what he called him? Brother. What if we called the people we were afraid of and that were our enemies and that we struggled with? What if we poured out love on them? And, and, and what difference making could it be in, in the world and in our relationship? The first thing he said to Saul was brother. He said the stage for their relationship. He set the stage for change. He set the stage for difference making. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, and Saul must have said, well, how did you know that, right? How did you know that? Has sent me so that you may see again. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this man that had been fighting against God, he's now praying over him that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, friends, difference makers in our life, we need to be doing that. Praying for them long before they claim Jesus for themselves, just like we're doing with this precious little baby girl. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up, and he was baptized, just like these precious folks this morning. New birth, new creation. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples at Damascus. He spent time with Ananias. He spent time with others, listening, learning. We later think he probably went to, to uh, uh, the uh, other areas and spending about to three years there, probably in Arabia and then in Jerusalem, just learning from the believers, right? And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This Jesus that he said no to is, is God in flesh. So he went into the place where he was trying to stop the belief. And instead, because of the difference making Jesus does in our life, because Ananias was willing to say yes instead of yes, but... 
there was a difference made in Saul's life. And later we understand his name changes to Paul on his first missionary journey, his Latin name, probably to get him into some places in the Roman world to share Jesus, right? To share Jesus. Ananias was a difference maker. He made a difference. Yes, Saul Paul wrote 13 or is attributed to 13 of the 27 books of our New Testament. He did three missionary journeys plus Rome, right? He, he gave rise to the, and the, the people of Galatia when this new thing called the church, this new movement, God started, right? God started. This thing is not ours, it's God's thing. Bring revival and press our souls, God. Stir us to be difference makers. Stir us to hang out with people that are difference makers. During my learning years as, as a clergy, there were two folks, two ladies that were in churches much larger than I. My goal was to have lunch with them about every other month, to press them, to learn from them. It was some of the best tuition money I ever spent. Who are the people you need to be spending time with that can speak truth into your soul? Who are the people you need to put some distance in your life, right? So here's what difference makers do. They bite their tongues, right? They bite their tongues. They think before they speak, right? They bite their tongues. And quickly... Difference makers are quick to forgive because we've been forgiven. What right do we have not to forgive others when we are God's beloved children, forgiven, full of grace and love? They stop. They stop saying negative, hurtful things, right? Zero, there's zero gossip in their lives. Difference makers understand that gossip's not just not saying something that wasn't true. That's what I thought, that you could certainly say the truth. No, gossip is anyone who's a part of the problem. The only time you should speak of something is if you're part of the solution. Otherwise, stop. Difference makers are upbeat. They're looking for things. They're intentional to see things half full, not half empty. They're looking. Difference makers are looking for things that I can say, well done. That was amazing, right? I'm so proud of you. I would pray with my children every evening, and sometimes it would be really hard to find something to say thankful for. But that was my goal. I am so thankful for you when you were kind to your sister or kind to your brother. And they keep it real. Folks know when you're not real and honest about the compliments. And difference makers start. They hang out with folks that make a difference maker in them. So I love this little Dr. Seuss quote, right? It's about being different. Today you are you, and that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is truer than you. However, friends... Being a difference maker isn't just being different. Being a difference maker is leading difference. As you look at these apples, it's leading difference. It's speaking truth and love. It's calling folks brother. It's engaging folks. And it's hanging out with folks that make a difference in you. Who are your difference makers? I encourage you this week to write them a note, send them an email, send them a text, say, hey, man, I, I just need to thank you for being you. And, and then look around at people you want to hang with that you can learn from, right? And then you say, who do you want me to speak truth in? Maybe I need to be on the floor building blocks with the children around here or going on youth events. Maybe I need to be a part of that new worship service. Who can I be a difference maker for, Jesus? So, will you hang out with folks that make a difference in you? And will you make a difference in others? Paul writing, Saul transformed by an amazing God writing to the church at Thessalonica, writing to us, says, so continue encouraging each other, building each other up. 
just like you're already doing. I can be, you can be a difference maker. Will you pray with me? Jesus, as we prepare to offer you our hearts and our minds and our souls and the ways you have blessed us financially and God, the gift of time, show us today how we can give back and offer to you what you've so graciously done to and for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. At this time, we're going to continue in our worship and responding to God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And I um, need you to do a couple of things as we do this. Um, there are also attendance pads. We're going to use the red ones. And if you'll just let us know that you're here, we love to stay connected with you. And this is one way that we can. And um, as these attendance pads are being passed, our offertory moment for today is super important. Um, this church is a community church. And it was just said this week that this church is like Grand Central Station, and it really is. If you're here during the week, you'll see maybe a dance team here practicing or um, Hamilton County Schools having some kind of professional development here. You name it, it probably happens here. And we're so thankful that through your generosity that we're able to open our building up to the community. So let's continue in our tithes and our offerings. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Bye. 
There is no one like you, Jesus. There is no one like you. Uh, what are you offering Jesus today? Are you inviting God to speak to you? You have choices to live in, to love and truth. God is calling you today. Maybe you want to come and pray. Maybe you want to say, God, I submit my soul, my life to you. I need to make this my home. These need to be the disciples that encourage my soul. Would you come now? challenging